Welcome, welcome to the last day of lecture material in Physics 235. This is week 14, day 3, scheduled for release on April 24th. And today we're going to be talking about double slit diffraction and diffraction gratings. It's kind of crazy that we're all the way at the end of this sequence now. For those of you who've been with me since the start of Physics 125, we've been through a lot. We tried a flipped classroom model and learned some things about it and each other and then abandoned that flipped classroom model for a more regular uh, lecture style. And then this term, things were going along according to plan until coronavirus happened and then we suddenly had to move online to these video lectures. So it's been a pretty kooky year in terms of how we're presenting material and I thank you guys for being patient with me and giving me good feedback and helping me improve my lectures so that they can help you learn the best that you possibly can. So I will be sad to see you all go. I wish I could say goodbye to you all in person, and we'll still have some more assignments and interactions, but this is the last time I get to talk at you all as a captive audience to one of my videos, so forgive me as I wax poetic for a little while. Anyway, to get to actual material, today we're going to return to the double slit diffraction pattern. I talked a little bit about it last time, about how you kind of have the double slit pattern and the single slit pattern at the same time, and I want to kind of get into what the intensity graph would look like and compare that to the actual pattern of dots you'd see on the wall. So, down at the bottom we have the actual interference pattern. And this is what we would actually see if we looked at the screen. This is in a dark room so that you can see the spots more clearly, but you see this actual pattern of bright and dark spots. And then up here at the top, we have a graph of the intensity of that pattern. So if you are observant, you might notice that the x-axis on this graph is beta over 2 where beta is one of the angles involved following a notation that we don't use. But you can ignore this and just think of this axis as y, at least while the small angle approximation holds. And I want to draw your attention to the similarities between these two ways of representing the same thing. We have a series of evenly spaced bright spots across this entire image. And these evenly spaced bright spots come from the double slit interference pattern. So we have one right here, and here, and here, and here, and so on. All these different spots I'm going to label in green are all of our evenly spaced bright spots from just the double slit portion of the pattern. And all of these are evenly spaced, so if I mark where each of these bright spots are on the y-axis, the horizontal axis here, you can see that they are all evenly spaced from each other. And since this is the double slit pattern, the spacing here is determined by the separation between the slits. So they've labeled this distance here, right here as the distance between dark spots, but the distance from dark spot to dark spot is the same as the distance from bright spot to bright spot for this. So we could also look at this distance right here. It's determined by the distance between the slits. And now let's go down to this bottom image. The actual interference pattern is seen on the screen and kind of notate the same thing. Every one of these little bright spots represents one of those peaks of that orange graph further above. So all those little tick marks I've drawn in green, those are the bright spots you get from the two different slits interfering with each other. And in theory, as long as the small angle approximation holds, these bright spots will all be evenly spaced until the theta starts to get above about 15 degrees or so. Then, we don't just have double slits here, or we don't have ideal double slits with 
no width at all. So we do have the distance between the slits D that's causing the double slit pattern, but each of these slits also has some sort of finite width to it. And I'm going to draw all of this in purple. So each of these slits has a width of A. So we should also get a single slit pattern here. So the double wide central maximum and the extra dark spots are all from single slit diffraction or single slit interference. So we have shown here as the diffraction envelope. This graph in red is what we would get if we just had one slit of width A. And we get our double wide central maximum, which goes from here to here. And then down in our diagram at the bottom, this is the central maximum that spans from the first zero on one side of center to the first zero on the other. And then we also have zeros that are caused by our single slit diffraction, which are at all those locations where that red graph hits the horizontal axis. And these correspond to the dark spots in our diagram below. We have one here and one here, and further out here, and further out here. Where the size of the central maximum and the spacing of these additional dark spots is all determined by the width of the slit. So this distance here from one Mach minima to another of the single slit diffraction pattern is determined by the width of the slits as is the width of the central maximum. And the central maximum is always twice as wide as the dark spots are spaced later on. So if we called this distance, say, L, then the central maximum is 2L wide. So we call this function in red here an envelope function. Envelope functions are commonly used to combine sines and cosines in a way that lets the amplitude change over time. So here we have our green pattern, which is just, again, these evenly spaced bright spots here. And if we had no width to our slits, if A were infinitely small, we would just have an evenly spaced sine wave just going across our entire diffraction pattern like this, with uh, evenly spaced peaks and not much change in terms of the brightness. But our slits also have some width to them, so that gives us the envelope function, and now our evenly spaced bright spots will oscillate underneath this envelope function. So you see that each of these peaks goes up only as high as the envelope function and no higher. Another example of an envelope function might be for damped oscillations. So when we talked about simple harmonic motion in class, we just said, in theory, this should run on forever, the amplitude never changing. But in real life, there's air resistance and friction, so the amplitude of the oscillations will die out over time. So you might have an envelope function that turns out to be a decreasing exponential, and you will put your oscillations underneath that. So I want to show you what that might look like in terms of a graph. So here I have the application that's in the utilities folder on a Mac called Grapher. And the first graph I want to put on here is just a regular sine function. So this would represent our double slit interference pattern, where we have just a bunch of evenly spaced maxima. And then we could apply an envelope function to it. So for my envelope function, I've picked 3 times e to the negative x over 4 which looks like this line here in blue. So what we do to find the overall function here is we multiply our sine wave in red by our envelope function in blue, and we get 
this function right here in green, which is just the product of these two functions. And hopefully you can see that we still have our same sine wave. Notice that the green graph and the red graph still have the same period. They still cross the x-axis at all the same times. They have their maxima at the same times. But uh, the amplitude is changing over time, and the amplitude is following the blue graph, the envelope function, perfectly. Every one of our maxima comes all the way up to the envelope function. So this is a similar idea of an envelope function bounding a, an oscillation, a sine wave, underneath of it. And that's the same thing we're seeing here. We have a regular old sine wave that is just oscillating up and down. That's this graph in here in the kind of orangish, tannish, yellowish color underneath our envelope function in red, where the sine wave comes from double slit and the envelope function comes from these single slits having individual width. So this was a lot of explanation just for one image, so let's do an example as well. So for two slits separated by 0.2 millimeters, each of those slits with a width of 0 0.02 millimeters is illuminated by 500 nanometer light and I want to know how many bright spots are visible within the central maximum. So just to be clear here, I'm basically asking how many bright spots are there between this dark spot and this dark spot. So based on the image, that would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bright spots are visible in the central maximum. But that's just for this random image, and now we want to do the same thing mathematically with numbers. So, we need to first find out where our dark fringes are for our single slit interference pattern. This central maximum comes from the single slit pattern. And the central maximum ends at the first dark spot. So, we need to use our single slit formulas to find out where this first dark spot is. So our single slit dark spots are given by the formula a sine theta equals m times lambda, and we're going to plug in with m equals 1 and solve for sine of theta. So whatever sine of theta is, it's equal to lambda over a. So we could actually plug in some numbers here, so let's go ahead and do that. So we have for lambda 500 nanometers, or times 10 to the negative ninth meters, divided by the width of the slits, which is that 0 0.02 millimeters, so 0 0.02 times 10 to the negative 3 meters. So sine of theta is equal to 0 0.025. So now we know at least how far out our central maximum extends in either direction. And now we need to figure out how many bright spots are there visible in this central maximum. Well, the bright spots, they come from the double slit pattern. So we want to bring in our double slit formulas here, which is d sine of theta equals m lambda. Note that these m's are referring to different things. The m for the single slit formula is referring to the dark spots from the envelope function. The m from the double slit formula is referring to the individual bright spots. So if I can throw that other image up on here real quick just to draw something to let you know. So on this diagram here, when we're talking about single slit, we're talking about the envelope function. So this location is m equals 1. Technically, this location is also m equals 1, or you could say m equals negative 1 if you prefer. Then over here is the m equals 2, or the second dark spot of the envelope function. Second dark spot of the single slit pattern is a 0 of the envelope function. So this is m equals 3 m equals negative 2 over here, and m equals negative 3 over here. That's a negative 2. 
but the M for our bright spots for our double slit pattern are referring to these, the sine wave that oscillates underneath the envelope function. So this is the M equals zero bright spot for the double slit pattern. This is the M equals one bright spot, the M equals two bright spot, the M equals three bright spot. So what we're trying to see is how big can our M from our double slit pattern get and still be within the central maximum, which is bounded by our single slit M equals one and negative one. So with our double slit formula, we now know a value for sine of theta and we can plug that in. So we have D times sine of theta, which is 0 0.025 no units there, because we divided meters by meters, so they canceled out, equals m times lambda. Or plugging in some values, the distance between the slits is that 0.2 millimeters, or 0.2 times 10 to the negative three meters, times sine of theta, which is 0 0.025, equals m, which we don't know, times our lambda of 500 times 10 to the negative ninth meters, or 500 nanometers. And from this, we can solve for m. And if you work it around, you get m equals 10, which means that the 10th bright spot over from center from the double slit pattern is at the same location as the first minima for the single slit pattern. Let me write that in words. So my question to you is, will we see this 10th bright spot from the double slit pattern? And the answer, it turns out, is no. We will not be able to see the 10th, dark, or the 10th bright spot from the single slit pattern, specifically because it's at the same location as the first dark spot from the single slit pattern. Remember that the single slit diffraction pattern is our envelope function. So if our envelope function is at a zero, it doesn't matter that our uh, sine wave underneath of it is at its maximum because we're going to multiply that maximum amplitude by zero, the value of the envelope function at that point. So we will not see the m equals 10 bright spot. Just to be clear, this is the blue m equals 10, the one from the double slit pattern. So which spots do we see? Well, we'll definitely be able to see 0 and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then 10 we don't see because that's the same location that the dark spot from the single slit pattern is. We will be able to see the m equals 11 bright spot, but it's no longer within the central maximum. So right here, this is the edge of the central maximum which is at m equals 10. But our pattern is symmetrical, so we'll still be able to see if we can see the first br bright spot over from the center to the right, we'll be able to see the first bright spot from center over to the left, and so on. So you can go from 0 all the way up to m equals 9. You can also go from 0 all the way out to m equals negative 9. And then we'll again reach the edge of the central maximum. So total, we are able to see 19 bright spots. The last thing we're going to talk about today, and the last thing we're going to talk about in this course, is diffraction gratings. So a diffraction grating is a lot like multiple slit interference with an infinite number of slits. So we just have an evenly spaced series of slits, and really there aren't an infinite number of them, but there's such a large number that n is at the very least approaching infinity, at least for how we think about these things. So I want to bring back a diagram from multi-slit interference so we can talk about what changes will happen to that diagram as we let n go to infinity. So I've now put up here the diagram we talked about when we looked at multiple slit interference. And we looked at two slits, three slits, and four slits. 
and we kind of got two different features here. One, we got our principal maxima, and we also had down here our secondary maxima. And we knew something about these secondary maxima. Uh, we knew how many there were and what their intensity was. So there were n minus 2 secondary maxima between each principal maxima. So if you look at 4, n equals 4, and there were 2 secondary maxima between every set of consecutive principal maxima. And then we knew something about the intensity of these secondary maxima as well. We knew the intensity of the secondary maxima was a factor of 1 over n squared times the intensity of the principal maxima. So let's think about what happens here as n goes to infinity. Well, infinity minus 2 is still infinity, so we'll have an infinite number of secondary maxima. And in terms of the intensity, the intensity of the secondary maxima, the infinite number of them, will be 1 over n squared times the intensity of the principal maxima. So these secondary maxima will have an intensity of 1 over infinity squared. And 1 over infinity squared is 0. So our secondary maxima, there may be an infinite number of them for diffraction grading, but they will have an intensity that is 0 times the intensity of the principal maxima. Or in words, the secondary maxima disappear entirely with a diffraction grading. Now let's talk about what happens to the principal maxima. As n gets larger, hopefully you can see that this central maxima gets narrower. So when we only had two slits here in, uh, we'll do this in orange, we had our central maxima went from here to here. So this was our two slit central maxima. And then for three slits, well that central maxima goes from here to here. I'm looking at the zeros of that red graph. So actually, that's not even quite where that zero of that red graph is. Zero of the red graph is closer to here. So this would be the width of that central maxima for three slits. And then if we continue on to four slits, we now have this width right here for four slits. So as n goes to infinity, these maxima are going to become very narrow. So what we actually get when we use a diffraction grating is an evenly spaced series of very, very narrow bright spots with no secondary maxima in between. So what we actually get is something for an intensity graph is something that looks a lot like what I, the image I've just dropped onto the screen right here. We have very, very tall, very, very narrow peaks for our central maxima and we have nothing in between. Our secondary maxima have disappeared. And then at the very bottom, in part B of this image, we see what the actual image on the screen would look like. These bright spots in this image are much smaller, narrower, than the bright spots that we got from the double slit experiment, which were kind of smeared out a little bit. And this is what an actual diffraction grating might look like. We would have a bunch of grooves cut into it, and these are like our slits and those grooves are cut at regular intervals. And that distance from one slit over to the next one, so from one slit to the next, this distance right here is D. So frequently your uh, diffraction gratings will be given in terms of lines per distance. So for example, something like 200 lines per centimeter. Sorry, 2,000 lines per centimeter. And then you would have to determine 
what D was based on that 2,000 lines per centimeter. So what I want to talk about now is what happens when we shine white light into a diffraction grating. So let me clear some things off here. When we send white light into a diffraction grating, white light is every color of light at once. So we'll have a central bright spot that is white, but then for our m equals 1 bright spot off to the side, if I haven't mentioned it yet, the formulas for diffraction grating are the same as the formulas for the double slit. So we still have our central maxima, and then m equals 1, and then m equals 2 off to the side. But when we think about this, the angle at which a light ray bends off to the side to form its m equals 1 maxima will depend on the wavelength. So when we look at purple light coming to this m equals 1 rainbow, that light will follow this path to get here with this angle. But red light will follow this path to get there with this angle, theta. So that means for the any maxima that are not the central maxima, for any m that is not zero, our thetas will depend on lambda, which means a diffraction grating will split out white light into its component colors of the rainbow. And again, this will happen for any m that is not equal to zero. You can see kind of the same thing on the other side. So if you have purple here on this rainbow, on the top, purple's always on the bottom, but below the central maximum, purple's on the top. So purple will always be closest to the central maximum in any of these rainbows, and red will be furthest away. We actually have some cheap little glasses that have diffraction gratings in them that I was planning to bring into class, and you can use them to look up at the fluorescent lights, and it spreads that light out into a rainbow. But that light for a fluorescent light bulb isn't actually pure white light. It's not every color. It's just some of the colors. So basically, you might get a red component, and then maybe there's a yellow component, and there's a green component and a purple one, but you might not have any blue or orange in there, depending on which atoms and molecules are in the fluorescent light bulbs and the different energy levels that they have going on. So we're going to do one more example problem and then that's it for today. So for a diffraction grading with 10,000 lines per centimeter, what's the length of the m equals 1 rainbow on a screen 2 meters away? So I want to add a diagram from your textbook onto this slide real quick. So this diagram shows the diffraction grating as well as the different uh, rays that form the ends of the rainbow. So we have a violet ray that creates a principal maxima right here at this location, and then we have red rays that create a principal maxima at this location, and at every point in between. So there's some green rays that converge right here that give you a principal maxima for green at that location, or for yellow at this location, or orange at this location, and just to complete the rainbow, blue here at this location. No, I haven't forgotten indigo. Indigo's a lie, it's a stupid color. There's a whole story there. If you wanna hear it, let me know. I'm perfectly happy to explain. Uh, but you have all of your rainbow colors, right? Orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, all having their principal maxima at different locations. So what we want to do here is we want to find out how far is the first principal maxima of violet from the center of our pattern, and we want to find out how far is the first principal maxima for red from the center of our pattern. And we're going to call those YV and YR. So we're working with a diffraction grating, so we get to use our double slit formulas. And if we want principal maxima, we need d sine theta equals m lambda. And we want the m equals 1 maxima here, so we're going to plug 1 into this equation for m. And 
We know our wavelengths of red and violet light. That's something you could look up in a book. So the wavelength of red light is 380 nanometers or 380 times 10 to the negative ninth meters. And for violet light, we have the wavelength of violet is 760 nanometers, which is 760 times 10 to the negative ninth meters. So we have, for both of our colors, the wavelength. We know the value for m. We're going to need to find theta, because once we find our theta values, both for red and for violet, we'll be able to come over here to this diagram and do a little bit of right triangle trigonometry where the purple triangle is outlined right here and the red triangle is outlined right here. So we need to find theta. And if we're gonna find theta for each of these colors, we need to find D, the distance between the slits. So in Animal Crossing language, Tom Nook has given us a task. If we want to find theta, first we need to go find D. So at least we don't have to fish for anything or pick any fruit off of trees. We just need to take the 100, sorry, 10,000 lines per centimeter and take one over that. So one over 10,000 lines per centimeter. Gives you one centimeter per 10,000 lines. And just to put this in meters now, that's 10 to the negative 2 meters divided by 10,000 lines, which gives us a value of 10 to the negative 6th meters per line. And line isn't a real unit. It's just there to help us kind of think through our unit cancel. So we would just say the spacing between the slits is 10 to the negative sixth meters. So now we can plug in some values. So I'm going to do red and red and purple and purple. So for red, we have our d, 10 to the negative sixth meters, times our sine of theta, which we don't know. I'm going to call that theta r for theta red, equals m, which is 1, times our wavelength for red, which is 380 times 10 to the negative 9 meters, and when we solve for theta r, we get 49.46 degrees. Then we can do something similar for violet. d is still 10 to the negative 6. It's the same diffraction grading for both colors. We still have sine of theta, but it's a different theta because it's a different wavelength. Equals m equals 1 times the wavelength of violet light, which is 760 times 10 to the negative 9th meters. So we can then solve for theta violet as 22.33 degrees. Well, when we're talking about any of our diffraction rules here, we always have tangent of theta is equal to y over d. And we can do that separately for our two different triangles. So here is the triangle in red where this distance here, this 2 meters, they've labeled it as x, but this is big D. So if we want to find y, that means y is just d times tangent of theta. So y for red light is going to be d, that 2 meters, times the tangent of the red angle, 49 0.46 degrees. So we get a value for y red of 2.338 meters. Then we do the same thing for purple or violet to find y violet is big D, 2 meters, times the tangent of this time the angle for violet, 22.33 degrees, gives us a value of 0.815 meters. So the distance we want is this distance right here. And that distance is just going to be y red minus y violet. So 
the length of, I'll call this just big L, the length of the rainbow. Big L is Y red minus Y violet, and we get a value of big L is equal to 1.523 meters. So if we made this setup ourselves, we would get a rainbow that's a meter and a half across on our screen that's two meters away. It's been wonderful working with you all. Thank you for working with me as we all adjusted to this very different and unexpected learning environment, but you've all been great and I appreciate the hard work you've put in. It's been a joy working with you and meeting all of you, and I'm sad that I don't get to say goodbye to some of you in person, but hopefully we will be back on campus in the fall and you can come by and visit my office or say hi in the hallway then. So whatever you plan to do with your life, good luck. Just because this is the last lecture does not mean I'm unavailable for questions, so please continue to come to the virtual office hours on Fridays. Please continue to reach out to me by email or set up a one-on-one -on -one Zoom meeting if you have questions. So all of that still happens, but this is the last lecture video that will be posted. Next week, we will have test one, or sorry, test two on Monday and Tuesday. You'll be getting an email about that. Uh, sometime on Thursday or Friday of this week. And then for Wednesday and Friday, I will just be hosting office hours at the time class normally happens, and I'll post the invitation for that on Piazza. That's, I believe, everything. Thank you for watching, and have a good day.